Okay, let's uh, let's start. So welcome again, uh, and welcome to the new uh, the new arrival. So welcome to our sixth webinar of uh, our retail webinar series. Um, if you join earlier, just uh, or not, it's uh, it's the sixth episode or of our webinars where we discuss about different solution how to improve customer and user experience in a retail area. Uh, we've been through end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, time management solution, uh, planning, POS, e-commerce. And today we will dedicate our webinar on the order journey and how to quickly act and respond to customer demand to make sure that we have the right uh, stock at the right place at the right time. So today, uh, let's see the, the agenda. So I am not alone as usual. So um, I will let them introduce themselves uh, quickly. So we have uh, Alan with us from Fluent Commerce. Hi everybody, uh, Alan Jackson here from, from Fluent Commerce. So I've been with the business for uh, four to five years and I'm here to take you through um, the, the Fluent solution, but also to give you some insight into um, how to think about the, the order journey and, and OMS projects. Thank you very much, Alan, and welcome. And thank you for being here with us. Uh, we have also Céline that you may uh, uh, know already because she was here two weeks ago for the e-commerce. Hi, Céline. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Céline, so I'm uh, managing the e-commerce and omnichannel practice uh, for APAC, and I'm happy to welcome this today uh, our partner Fluent Commerce to discuss about OMS. Thank you, Céline. Thank you, Céline, and myself, uh, for those who were there uh, already in the past. So I am Nicolas, I'm in charge of uh, retail and planning practice for Viseo in APAC. Um, so here today, um, we will see first, uh, again, uh, for those who already been there, sorry about that, but quickly about Viseo and our retail uh, digital parts. We will have, to, uh, have a fluent commerce introduction uh, by Alan. Um, and then after um, Alan and Céline, uh, it will be a kind of Q&A session and discussion about how uh, foreign commerce can help in the order journey to make it uh, seamless, easy, and uh, efficient uh, to, uh, to manage your, your order in your omni-channel um, footprint. And we will end up by a Q&A, uh, sorry, Alan, <laughs> we will end up by a Q&A session. So don't forget that in the application, you have a, a question part feel free to share your, your questions at this, uh, on, this, uh, on this part. Thank you very much. So let's go quickly um, on the, how, uh, what is the situation for the retailer part um, on the next slide. So we know that, um, we know that uh, retailers have been through a lot uh, this year. Um, so here it's not to, to mention only about COVID because obviously the situation this year just uh, highlight a bit more some issues but why they need to transform the organization to enable an efficient omni-channel uh, experience, right? So obviously we have uh, more and more, and it's uh, even more true during COVID, an unpredictable demand, um, new ways of consuming, either online, offline, through partners and so on. So this makes it uh, a challenge uh, for, for the retailers. And in order to make sure to, to gain more customers, there's new launcher strategies. And all this needs to cope with also some production and procurement issues, uh, unfortunately, um, which were even more true during the lockdown. Uh, so this is, um, it's important at some point to ensure that our level of stock are at the right place at the right time, but which require uh, to optimize the distribution um, for the retailers and to simulate the resilience on the, on the supply chain in order to make sure again, to have the right product at the right place and not outdated stocks um, for sure and to avoid a uh, shortage. And all this to enable uh, uh, an efficient and um, uh, an efficient omni-channel and customer experience um, to make sure that uh, we can uh, sell as much as we can during this pandemic, but also the rest of the year. So let's go quickly for those who don't know Viseo uh, to a few, uh, few key things. So um, Viseo, we, we, have, uh, we try to have a full, a unified commerce vision uh, with some solution. So here we have a, a 360 expertise, right? So expertise on, on the solution where fluent commerce is obviously 
a major uh, partner for us, among with Anaplan, Salesforce, SAP, Segid, uh, Commerce Cloud, and, and Shopify. So we try to link, obviously, all the back office to the front office, online and offline, through the CRM. So on the left, we can see that we, we try to have a unified back office to be only channel ready. Um, and in order to link all these solutions, and also, obviously, I would say, some um, digital aspect, obviously, uh, some application, e-payments, and, uh, and so on. So for Viseo, on our side, um, just a couple of words on this uh, on the next slide. We have a global footprint uh, worldwide. Uh, in APAC, we are more than 240 people. Worldwide, we are 2,200. Um, we try to, as we did um, explain earlier, to have a 360 view on the solution, but we try also to have a 360 view, end-to-end -end view on the, um, on the services to accompany our customers, to leverage on technology, to transform um, and innovate to make, uh, to make our customer more efficient. So we start from the imagine, ideation, advisory, architecture, who uh, we go also to the build implementation, and we finish uh, by the perform what we call the build, the run, where we can support our customers either in the day-to-day -day operation or in the evolution enhancement they want to apply. So within Viseo, uh, we have a well a good knowledge, I would say, about the retail. And we have to show this slide, um, the next one, to, to show a bit about few names, right? 40% of our business is with CPG and retail. Uh, so here you can see some names. We, we support some customers, obviously, in Europe, but also in Asia, in the US, um, sometimes on Salesforce, sometimes on Fluent Commerce, sometimes on Segid, sometimes on SAP, sometimes a few solutions together. Uh, and they trust us to accompany them on this uh, journey. So it was short uh, to avoid people to, to get fed up about this uh, this presentation. So now I will hand over to, um, to Anan uh, and Céline, first to present uh, Fluent Commerce, and uh, then after to present the Omni Channel and other journey. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Um, so m moving on then into just a little bit of uh, a background on, on Fluent Commerce. Um, <clears throat> so the, the areas that we've focused on and we've seen driving value into um, are across these, these key six areas. Um, we feel very strongly that you can't really do order management um, very well unless you um, solve the, the inventory challenge as well. So. Um, by aggregating inventory from um, around uh, the, the estate or the organization or the pools of inventory that you'd like to leverage. Um, we, we tend to advise to, to try and aggregate those into a single place and um, which firm can accommodate um, and then use that, that aggregated view to support and, and underpin um, the order and fulfillment processes that you, you want to enable both for internal optimization to run as a retailer, but also um, for the consumer experience, ultimately on uh, you know, their shopping journey is is really what you're you're striving to to achieve. So being able to click and collect and um, ship from from local stores and be able to return anywhere to the network, regardless of where you've purchased those those goods, um, uh, is it, really the kind of nirvana state that you're aiming for. Uh, and being able to to fulfill from anywhere is critical as well. Um, and those those can you know, tend to be seen as kind of the happy paths, but when things don't go perfectly and, uh, you know, the manual process and intervention is required, um, how are you handling and how can we best help to get the right mix of automation and, and business process to deliver good customer retention, loyalty service so that they come back and, and purchase again. Um, so these are the, the six areas that we tend to focus and, and um, we've, we've seen a lot of value from, from our uh, client base in, in these areas. Um, and then when we think about um, why, fluent, why fluent commerce is chosen um, for distributed order management um, uh, projects, uh, it's, it's proven experience. So the, the pedigree in, in the industry in, in B2C and retail in particular, um, we've got many multi-country, multi-brand um, uh, clients where um, you know they've got a variety of business models um, where they they um, you know might be uh, franchise businesses or um, 
you know, the, the, they like to leverage different pockets of um, 3PL or, or dropship um, based fulfillment models to um, fulfill their customer orders. Um, we always tend to get chosen um, for the, the modern uh, architecture that we've um, built the system on um, from day one um, and having best practice uh, workflow templates that we've developed over many many years and, and experience with uh, you know our, our client base and which continue to evolve and continue to improve and um, that allows us to to start projects quicker um, so that that phase one of a lot of projects can um, can be achieved quite rapidly and um, also the cloud native nature of the platform is is really um, you, you know a, a big ticket item I think for a lot of businesses today who are who really want to become cloud first and you know, have, have started it, um, you know, or, or if not already on a journey of migrating a lot of systems over to, to cloud-based technology, um, we're, we're no different in that regard. So, you know, a single version of the application that everybody's using is really helpful. Um, and then it kind of comes down to flexibility. So, yes, we have standard templates and yes, we, we can advise on a, on a best practice approach, but every client's different and needs, um, you know, vary from from project to project. So we have a lot of flexibility in the platform that underpins um, those processes. That's really helpful. Okay. Um, so uh, I think, um, uh, Celine, I, I don't know if we want to then, um, you know, obviously there's, there's a, some ecosystem um, categories that we can um, look at as we go through um, the kind of next stage of the presentation. But, um, I, you know, this, is, this comes back to some of the earlier slides that, that we saw earlier interconnectivity into various systems around the landscape is quite important um, but we might touch on some of these and and uh, you know as we go through the, the next stage of the presentation okay thank you Alan for summarizing the main reasons to choose an OMS like fluent commerce um, obviously order management systems have certainly had their moment in the spotlight this year with retailers relying on them to be able to keep selling through lockdowns and massive shifts in consumer behavior. And one of the most important differentiators for retailers this year was speed. Um, how quickly were they able to adapt to changing customer needs, lockdown, potential shutdown of warehouses, uh, supply chain issues, etc. Uh, could you explain what it means to change your order fulfillment rapidly and maybe show us a few examples of that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, you know, I think this year has really been a strong test um, for, for the industry. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying. Um, but the, the ability to adapt um, quickly, you know, you've pointed that out, is, is incredibly important. So uh, being able to... Um, mold your fulfillment locations and the sourcing strategies and you know the the ability to be able to make those changes rapidly is, is quite important um so if, if we think about how um uh, you know software can help with that process um i'm just using um some of the the screens here in, in fluent to to kind of illustrate that so um by by visualizing um uh, and, and providing a modifiable set of processes um, really helps to uh, alleviate you know some of those challenges um, so, so having a tool like this that um, not only presents the end-to-end -end processes that underpin how how order uh, life cycles you know are defined but the ability to to be able to zero in on a specific area of that process and make changes is, is quite important um, so within the Fluent platform, we, we've architected with, with that ethos in mind. So having a, a kind of drag and drop editor where I can um, add new logic in and, and make changes uh, to, to logics, uh, quite important. Um, so in this case, I might decide that I want to slightly modify my sourcing strategy, um, for example, to um, you know, use driving direction APIs um, to decide what's the optimal place to fulfill from. Um, and in the same way, I could, you know, um, quite rapidly change my sourcing strategy to focus on pools or grades of locations. Um, you know, maybe maybe some of my store network has to close as a um, in-store, uh, you know, foot foot traffic store for for people on High Street, but they're still stuck in those stores, and I should still try to leverage those for fulfilling online orders. So turning those locations into into dark store. 
um, fulfillment centers is something that you can do within the platform um, by you know leveraging a, a view of locations. So here I've got some um, Australia-based locations in the system and, and being able to um, you know define what those locations are responsible for, which networks they sit in. Um, for example, I'm, I might have a, a home delivery specific network that provides an available to sell and it contains these networks in here. So be, uh, sorry, these locations. So being able to move those locations in and out of pools allows retailers to quickly reconfigure how the system is, is being set up. Uh, thank you, Alan. Yeah, it's obviously a very good, uh, very flexible tool and user friendly. Um, and also on another topic, I would like to highlight uh, another issue, main issue retailers often struggle with, it's uh, inventory. It's always a key challenge, and particularly this year, uh, the ability to uh, to be able to see and access all the inventory, have an accurate vision uh, up to date, uh, it has become crucial uh, in our world today. And uh, because we want to be able to sell as many stocked items as possible, so Fluent Commerce does it quite well. So, uh, can you show us how Fluent Commerce helps make inventory accurate, up to date, and uh, available across all the locations? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you, you've quite rightly highlighted something that's you know become a, a very, very important topic. You know, in the, in the kind of four to five years that I've been in, in Fluent, I think we we started life out um, thinking that you know the order was the most important entity for which we, you know, we typically uh, leverage, but but actually inventory has kind of now uh, become on par, if not more important in terms of subject matter. So, you know, being able to present availability online as, as an example is um, very important. So, um, you know, for instance, if I zero in here on um, a specific set of products, um, I, I can influence where we're holding an on hand um, kind of view of inventory for, for certain products and, and being able to track and log a history of how that's being sold, reserved, returned, um, any pre-order or replenishment or forecast of stock can be held in here as well. Um, and ultimately all of these increments and decrements are, are being tracked during the life of this piece of inventory to, to provide a, an on-hand value, um, which then allows us to uh, create business logic around that to present an available to sell online um, that is is as accurate as it can be because we're you know digesting point of sale um, and warehouse uh, management um, updates and bringing this all together into one system for the purposes of presenting that ATS online. Um, but also being able to put in some controls around that is quite important. So if I um, again just pick a, a specific uh, product set and um, find a particular location that I'm, I'm interested to look at. You can see here, being able to put in buffer controls and, and safety stock thresholds to say, well, I, I always need to reserve a quantity of one, or indeed you could customize this to, to make that based on a percentage um, so that it's it's dynamic um, with the, the um, uh, you know, the, the stock that's available on hand, we can then present an, an ATS that then is presented online to the consumers on a on a storefront like this. So this is a you know Salesforce Commerce Cloud storefront, but really um, for us this could be any channel. It could be an in-store kiosk. It could be you know um, a a uh, customer service rep using um, a tool that uh, helps them place orders online um, on the phone. So that there's you know it really doesn't matter to us. Um, but the, the main thing is is that presenting those options and um, convenient availability. Uh, uh, options with respect to collection delivery you know they might be motivated by proximity by time by cost and um, so serving those those transparent options up front um, will really help uh, consumers convert uh, at a higher rate uh, yes indeed uh, avoiding out of stock issues is key um, because the displaying out of stock items is really disappointing for a customer I had yeah. this experience yeah. uh, recently with ikea or uh, some the the you just want something and uh, you discover at the checkout page that there is nothing left 
So it can be, and also it, it can be very painful and inefficient for the back office staff when they, when you can even check out and uh, and then uh, you realize that your product is out of stock. So they will have to waste time in refund processes and everything. Um, so really, really important uh, topic. Um, I would like also to talk about stores because a lot of stores have been closed. Uh, some are still closed, some have reopened, but uh, reduced capacities uh, in servicing customer. And uh, some uh, some stores have been converted into the dark stores, uh, what you were uh, talking about, or mini fulfillment centers for online orders. So um, do you have a view on how COVID might have changed the role of the store for retailer and what that means for store staff? Store staff, sorry. And uh, how does the OMS can support this transition? Yeah, so, so I think um, if you want to leverage your store stock and, and uh, you know, uh, enable the store associates to be able to leverage that store stock for online orders, then um, you know, generally uh, technology you know, really helps with that process, especially if you've got, you know, high volumes of orders or, you know, um, large batches of orders that you, you need to process um, that become that can become quite tedious if you're running a manual process. Um, so uh, in, in light of, of that uh, problem or, or challenge, Fluent has added an application to its its stack of tools. Um, this one's called Service Point. I mean, this is really geared towards exactly what you've just described, um, which is a, you know, a store associate who can use really any, any technology that has an internet connection and a web browser um, is able to um, see orders that are moving in and out of that particular location that either need to be picked or are being you know, shipped from that location to a customer's address or being collected in a, in a click and collect um, kind of order process. Um, but but I think you know trying to make that as as seamless as possible and um, being able to cater for those uh, situations where maybe you might need to short pick or handle situations where you don't necessarily have um, everything that you've been asked in your in, in the, the order process and being able to deal with those uh, kind of partial fulfillment scenarios is is critical, right? So the, those exceptions are the the things that can cripple businesses if, if they're not designed correctly, if they're not thought about um, properly at, at the beginning of projects. Um, and, and those kind of exception use cases, again, all handled through our, our workflow and is all underpinned by business processes. In, in this case, the store staff don't need to uh, focus too much on, on this particular issue. The, the system will take care of that for them in an automated way. It's going to reallocate those items that they can't fulfill and ship them to the store and um, split orders and, and deal with those situations so that you don't um, have to execute a partial refund or disappoint the customer ultimately and, and the customer experience you know you can you can keep at that, that level that you've set and expected online um, rather than them feeling like they you know um, that they're walking away from the situation with um, a poor brand experience and will go elsewhere in the future. All right, uh, thanks. Thanks for this uh, explanation. Um, due to uh, also due to this job, some of this job being closed, uh, you, you had probably an increased volume of customer service calls. So, um, for because for a client who are using few different systems to track and order the customer orders, uh, it takes a lot of uh, their resources. So. Um, do you think that um, order management system could help, can help streamline any of this? Yeah, I, I think that order management has a critical role to play in um, many personas within the, the retail organization. You know, we've, we've talked about the consumer, we've talked about you know, head office and, and um, digital and econ teams that are responsible for defining processes and, and setting software up. But the, the customer service rep is another really important persona that um, OMS needs to assist um, to 
you know to make their life easier and, and ultimately which again is a, is an indirect relationship into the consumer experience um so so delivering um critical information that's easy to find for them to be able to do that and, and execute on that is really important so you know a screen like this that presents um you know all the information about uh, what's in an order and how it's being fulfilled and where is it going and the the activity since the that order began and it you know a sort of trail of um all the different events and and things that have happened uh, up to present day um but then a step further to that is then to offer um amendment and um you know the, the ability for them to be able to change the path that that order is is on to to meet the customer requirement or demand so being able to change order types from you know collection to delivery or vice versa because you know the consumer wants to wants to um change how they're uh, getting their goods or if you want to run an exchange and you know replace one product and um add something else in, instead um you know being able to facilitate all of that uh is really important otherwise um your customer's just going to feel a little bit like uh you know I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced issues in the past where um you know you place an order and it kind of goes into a into a black hole and, and you don't you know the, the next you hear of it is when it arrives at your door and if you want to make some change between those two points in time um it can be problematic but i think providing this self-service online through through the online storefront is very helpful um, but also you've got to provide you know the, the tools for customer service to be able to do that um, and, and there's probably uh, two mechanisms that, that we tend to see one is through the order management tool itself um, but quite often you know customer service teams are already using technology um, to, to help them do their job to give that 360 degree uh, um, <clears throat> uh, you know uh, customer view but also being able to you know log tickets and, and and be able to see everything that they need to with respect to that particular consumer that they're dealing with on the phone so as such we've uh, taken a step to build connectivity into tools like this so this is um salesforce service cloud and you know the ability to be able to um give customer service reps the, the um, functionality to not even have to log into the fluent user interface if they don't want to they can do everything in here and um, that i just showed you in the previous screen so it's not just about seeing the data but being able to um, actually act on it as well so being able to run those revisions and cancellations and everything in here is um, you know, quite quite an important piece of capability to enable Yeah, that leads me to um, to another question uh, because you are talking about this uh, integration with Salesforce. Um, you sh you you presented a slide just before. Uh, how uh, does Fluent Commerce integrate with the other systems? So you have, uh, for instance, uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Um, is it easy to to connect Fluent Commerce to this kind of uh, of, of platform? Yeah, so specifically on the on the Salesforce side, um, we've built cartridges for Commerce Cloud and for Service Cloud. Um, the the nature of the force.com platform means that is it is really a plug and play app that you you download, you you install into your org, you you enter some API connectivity details so that you know you're connecting into the right account um, within the Fluent stack. Um, and once you've filled out those those fields, then um, it'll start to pull in the order data, and you can start to manage, you know, your your end to end orders. So, um, that's a really fast process, um, and, and doesn't require, you know, a project team to to enable. It's probably more about understanding how to best use it once it's in place to, you know, um, meet the processes that a retailer may have in in, in place. Um, Commerce Cloud tends to be, um, it, you know, has a bit more effort associated with it because each um, brand's storefront is different. It has a, a, a unique experience. Um, it has a lot of the same building blocks with, you know, product listing pages and product detail pages and checkout flows, et cetera, where you want to run um, a synchronization of locations and product catalogs um, uh, and you want to authenticate between the two tools and, and a lot of that a lot of those integration patterns of data exchange are, are all provided as part of our cartridge um but but i think the the tricky bit is is talking about availability and wh when do i synchronize inventory when do i request do a live call for availability 
um, how do I want to um, present order status? Um, those ones tend to differ from project to project. So we we provide a you know a toolbox that allows them to decide how they want to set that up and, and build that out based on the you know the, the customer experience. That's really the, the starting point is what's the experience you want to provide for the consumer. Um, then outside of that, uh, you know, I put, we put some some logos here of third party platforms that we've that we've worked with in various projects in different regions, and, and these are the ones that we tend to see. Um, uh, order management, uh, you know, is is a platform or a space where we're integrating with quite a lot of pieces around uh, the the technical ecosystem within a retailer. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of stakeholders and, and parties that will sit around the table when we're going through projects. And um, because it's hooked into point of sale, so you have retail operations and then you've got kind of back end um, logistics supply chain um, and, and shipping. Um, you've got all of the, the invoicing and payments and tax and sales order data that, that's being exchanged with, with ERP and, and payment gateways. Um, and then there's the, the front end side of it with, with commerce and, and CMS platform. So it, it, um, there's there's no kind of shying away from the you know that there is there is integration to be done with these projects um in order for it to really give a good um end-to-end -end experience for all the personas that are involved so uh, as such the, these tend to be the partners that we see uh, uh come up quite often yeah thank you for this yeah it seems um quite uh convenient and um easy to integrate with those uh, partners. Thank you, Alain, for this uh, very interesting demo of Fluent Commerce, OMS. Uh, it seems that it solves a lot of issues that uh, retailers encounter at this moment. Um, we can move now to your Q&A. I, I would like to give, uh, to give a voice to the, to the audience and to to see the the question and the question that you could have, so I leave the the stage to uh, Nicola, who will uh, will read these questions for us. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, Liz. Thank you for giving me uh, giving me the virtual stage <laughs> for for uh, for this uh, for this webinar. So yes, thank you also, obviously, Alan for and Celine for animating and presenting the OMS uh, from Fluent Commerce. I think we could we could I mean people could see how easy it is to to set it up to um, to manage exception or to or to deal with all the different cases. Um, we receive indeed uh, some um, some questions. Um, been shared, so please, while we are replying uh, the the other questions, don't forget to ask yours if you have. Um, so there is a, a question that. Uh, uh, I mean, we have almost the same every time. So everybody see the solution and they think, okay, it's nice to implement. It looks cool, but how long does it take to to implement uh, Fluent Commerce uh, OMS? Who uh, who yeah. will take? This? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a critical question. I think uh, Celine and and I probably have. Um, uh, ans answers on this. Um, I, I might just say, from a from a fluent perspective, you know, the, those those projects have, have varied. It really depends upon the scope and the complexity, and you know, the geographical footprint and the number of brands. Um, you know, I think that that's that's kind of uh, it, you know um, an obvious thing that I think we we would all appreciate. Um, we've seen projects, you know, sort of anywhere from the kind of three to four month um, cycle at the low end up to, you know, maybe six months and, and a little bit more, depending upon, um, you know, wh where the project's been run and, you know, how broad the scope is. Um, so that's certainly one one perspective. And I think Sunim probably will have, uh, you know, uh, your view at, at Visio as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have. Oh, sorry. Um, I have. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I was uh, thinking about like uh, four months uh, for yeah, for uh, medium-sized project uh, with uh, but with a scoping period like um, around one month of scoping and uh, solution design to start. Uh, but yeah, I would say uh, four months and then uh, if you can go up to six uh, if you have a really more complicated uh, environment. Yeah. yeah, but I think, I mean, it's important to, to give the range, right? Because some people may think, okay, let's have a quick win <laughs> first, because uh, maybe right now they are struggling uh, uh, to manage the different uh, process and, and flow, right? So, uh, of products. 
Um, there's one question about how how do I know when actually I need an OMS? And there's a minimum of uh, websites, stores, countries, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so so uh, it's interesting because we, we've we've spoken with a lot of clients and where we where, where we tend to, to see success is when they've attempted to try to do this before or already have a tool in place um, and, and, and what tends to be the tipping point that defines whether you know an OMS is really needed in the stack is you know you, you, you've pointed out number of fulfillment locations um, I think is, is a critical KPI um, so you know we have some projects that have in the tens of stores, and then we we go right up to the the hundreds and into you know they're planning to roll out into the into the thousands. So, um, and and those locations, then the the more complex the grading of those locations or the, the types that they see, is is really where things start to get um, really challenging for them, where they have stores and warehouses and hub locations and concessions and three PLs and dropship vendors, and um, that's where a piece of software is really going to help drive optimal decision making about what's the best way to fulfill orders um so that, that's where we we tend to see the the crux of of the decision okay thank you thank you alan um thank you alan there is um an, uh, two questions uh I received two questions now um i think you mentioned about okay you can integrate uh fluent commerce obviously with a with different partners, right? Uh, supply chain partners, logistic partners, obviously solution and that kind of things. Um, the question is more about the, the API. If there's any uh, standard API uh, built around Fluent Commerce, is there uh, how uh, Fluent Commerce can integrate with these uh, with these partners? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think you know te technology has really shifted over to um, an API and and uh, you know, a, a microservice type architectural model. Um, uh, so absolutely F Fluent uh, follows this this methodology as well. So we, we provide um, GraphQL and REST-based APIs, which um, provide um, the, the kind of connectivity and uh, enable the right data patterns uh, in and out of different systems that we would need to connect to. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about uh, uh, products and the product catalogs and inventory and locations um, and orders and order status and carrier bookings and fulfillments to warehouses you know we're starting to connect to quite a lot of different systems around around the uh, the IT landscape so um, yeah pr providing a high performance and highly available set of APIs is really important to achieve that um, and uh, uh, you know, another sort of recommendation um, again is that where we see success is that there is a, a piece of middleware or an ESB in place um, where either the partner that's involved in, in running the project um, runs that for the client or the client has, you know, an internal IT team themselves that, that runs certain pieces of technology in the stack like the middleware. And so they can, they, they tend to have a seat at the table who are getting involved in building out integration specs and making sure that all of the the coverage is there and, and protection to ensure that you know data is being exchanged in a, um, a complementary way, but all of the error handling and session timeouts and all the other kind of technical things that can get in the way if, if things aren't working correctly are all thought about and considered and, and covered at the start of the project. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I think it was very comprehensive. I hope that it answers the, the question. Um, there's another question about uh, those. I mean, I think uh, I think you get, you would say yes because you may treat it different. I mean, the same way. Those fluent comments are function for recurring orders. Yeah. So um, we've we've seen this requirement um, coming up uh, now and again, depending upon the 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 business and and the the industry. Um, so uh, if there is. Um, something generating that recurring order um you know in a in a in a world where maybe somebody wants to um uh, you know reorder something on a monthly basis um for instance uh, that that can tend to have a, a billing cycle associated to it or um you know maybe it's more of a b2b to c type scenario where maybe they're paying on an account or an in a monthly invoice and and you know they're they're getting uh, a a monthly or a weekly um 
uh, set of products that, that are you know being shipped to them on a regular basis. So um, th those orders will will come into the platform like any other um, order, uh, recurring or not, and and Fluent's then able to optimize and suggest what's the best way to fulfill that. And Fluent doesn't have um, you know a subscription and billing module that manages that that whole process, right? And um, that's really another tool, and we would see that happening externally. Um, uh, that there's plenty of software platforms out there that you know handle that very elegantly, and you know we're not aiming to to cover that logic um, in, in any shape or form at this point. Um, so there is a dependency on another tool to to manage the order creation, um, because while we could schedule and and you know run the rec recurrence creation of that order within our platform. Um, it, it would start to get messy because there isn't a way to see, you know, a 10,000 foot view of what all the schedules are, what all the different plans are. If you want to make a change to that recurring order, what does that look like? And that would be a, a customized a customization in the system that might actually be best handled in e-commerce or, you know, in a platform where the order is actually coming from in the first place. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think, I mean, you, you, you may not have a definite route, right, for the recurring order. He has to, I mean, the point is also to, to embrace the OMS system, because maybe one day it will be shipped from the store, maybe one another day, the other month, it will be shipped from the warehouse. It depends on the availability, right, of the, yeah. of the, of the, of the product exactly. at uh, that location, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anana. There's another question that is a bit linked to the second one I uh, asked earlier. It was about the, um, I mean, you, you mentioned, okay, this platform, you have the setup of it, right? Uh, you have the connection of it. Uh, you have some choice to make at some point, some operational uh, choice, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So what is the, um, what is the organization, what is the minimum setup in terms of uh, uh, profile, roles, process because obviously when we when we move into the OMS it, there's it's not only a, a transformation of IT right I think you need to create some uh, some roles you need to know who is in charge of what um, do you have any I mean um, suggestion on it or or input on that yeah so um, we, there's definitely some some common stakeholders that we see from project to project um, you know the the um, the, the, there's a at least one, if not several, subject matter experts that are required from the the retail client side to help understand what is it that they're trying to achieve for the customer experience. So, you know, a lot of times that's uh, people who are working on the digital or e-commerce team. Um, you know, want to want to provide a click and collect um, feature on the front end as a as a checkout option, or they're trying to enable pre-order or you know surface back order um, replenishment stock, uh, so that we don't get those out of stock messages. Um, like Celine mentioned earlier, um, so so there is definitely a kind of front end consumer experience digital commerce person or people that tend to be involved in. The, the order journey, and um, then then you you might have somebody from the customer service side um, who's uh, really trying to make sure that the customer service reps that that are working in the organization are getting you know their voices heard and you know the problems and challenges that they have to do their job effectively are being catered for as part of the project, um, and and then you'll have a, a sort of retail ops uh, person that's generally involved. I mean, if you're talking about fulfilling from store and um, you know, there's there's warehouses involved in the fulfillment process, then that, that kind of supply chain stakeholder is quite important as well. Um, so you, you do get a consortium of subject matter expertise within the business that tend to get involved. Um, and uh, then in terms of the project team itself, I mean, you know, you guys at Visio would, would know this all too well. Um, you know, there's, there's a sprint team that are involved, which can, you know, is a, a mix of um, development and business analysis and test depending upon you know how much you want uh, how much the retailer is going to want to add into those workflows that isn't there as standard we try to recommend to stay you know pretty pretty standard software kind of project 101 is you know tr try to try to go live with a, a minimum amount of customizations that you can um, so that you can kind of focus on things like integration and, and getting the system up and running and then as a phase two or a, or a you know a, a phase 1.1 year then making small tweaks and optimizations and, and learning from the first phase to 
um, really shorten the time that it takes to then do kind of small iterations and, and quick releases as you move forward from there to, to make those adaptations. Um, so, so that's that's a very I guess a very kind of high level view of project. But but I would say that you know each client's requirements do vary. So that does require um, slightly different um, project team from from project to project with respect to the, the kind of stakeholders and and key people that are involved. Okay. Okay. Great. So thank you. Uh... Thank you, Alan. I mean, it's, uh, it's very, uh, very interesting to, to hear this information from, uh, from you. Um, I, I just, I mean, I don't know if we have enough time. Um, I, I would like to, I would like myself, maybe why not to, to ask one, uh, one question, so one like this, it gives a, uh, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's, um, the, you have a, I have a question in mind. I have actually two. I'm not sure. I just would like to make sure that you, you discuss about why not the, the return, uh, the return parts. I think you did right, but I'm not sure, right? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, that's a you, you raised a, a good point there. Um, so it, along with the customer service uh, journeys that I mentioned and, and pushing into Salesforce Service Cloud, the the return function is extremely important, right? So so being able to um, uh, service a, a return visualization to make it really easy to do a you know uh, a reverse logistics or reverse fulfillment process to go and pick that item up from the, the customer's address or to facilitate a, a return in store um, capability as well um, is is really important right because um, it, it's it's about servicing all of those exception use cases and when when things don't go down happy path ensuring that we can you know provide that experience both in both in the store but also through um the online self-service channel or through through customer services is, is really important so yeah fluent has that return capability and um that's also underpinned by business rules as well and i, I showed you those those uh, workflows and, and rules um from an order perspective earlier on but and um, that methodology permeates throughout the entire system. So how a return is defined is, is also based on workflow, um, as is the you know pick and pack process in the in the store has has a workflow as well. Um, okay. So hopefully that hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's important when you. I think people maybe tend to unfortunately um, experience the returns. <laughs> so. I think um, it's, uh, it's I mean, the good part of the e-commerce is yeah, you can have more sales, right? The pick and pack and such kind of things. But but then unfortunately with this, you have the burden of the return. So it's good to know that if you can automate this or, or on your side also, to know how yeah. to dispatch it. And uh, and obviously there's a process behind, obviously it has to have a quality check to make sure that uh, the product is, is it can be sold again or not. But this is um, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, um, Anand. Uh, I think we will uh, we'll stop here for for today on the Q and A. Um, for sure, if you wish uh, to have more detail uh, questions and uh, and uh, presentation more fine tuned, you can reach out to to us. It will be happy to to uh, to go through this uh, with you. Um, now I would just would like, as you yeah you were showing the next slide, and then uh, thank you. Just would like to remind you guys that. We have another uh, session for this year that will be on the 17th of December. So it's the last one before after people go to Christmas or, or some break or not. Uh, it will be on consumer engagement in a retail with the Salesforce uh, platform. So for example, uh, Alan mentioned today about the service management. So this can be also something that we get information from uh, from uh, from foreign commerce and how to integrate the three, to have a 360 view with different systems foreign commerce POS e-commerce um, finance also if there's a problem of uh, of payment or, or such things and how to leverage on that uh, to have better better view so I think uh, there's maybe another slide you can register to this. Uh, to this again on our website, where you can also see the previous uh, webinars that we have, the replay, and you can register for the next session. So I would like to wish you all uh, a good uh, good day. Thank you very much again, Alan and Celine, for being with us uh, 
with me today, like this, I'm not the only one talking. <laughs> it was very great, very uh, interesting. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you.